What was that like, that experience being that young and then becoming as big as you did? Like, how, how, did, how was that? It was just a whirlwind, really. You don't, I can't really remember a lot of it because everything was fast, fast, fast. We were gone so much and we were just there and there getting pulled every which way, different countries all the time and touring a lot. Um, we were partying a lot, so there was a lot of hangovers and a lot of forgetful nights. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was just kind of, it was so new to us and we were so young that a part of us just thought also, is this just how it is? going to be like and is this going to be forever um because you you know we're we're 19 20 years old so and it it was really fresh so yeah it was it was definitely an experience but one i I don't remember a ton of island signed us before half hour power um they he they signed us off this like little eight minute epk we did um and i had like some our demos music behind it and you know us going around our hometown basically wreaking havoc on our hometown and then just filming it all and then putting it into this little eight minute video um and then they so they put out half hour power in 2000 on this on the mighty mighty boston's label big rig which was kind of through island and uh and then we just that was just meant to be a touring album it was just they, they wanted us to tour the u.s and all this stuff for you know a year year and a half before they put out a real album so they said, but if, you're gonna, if we're going to put you on tour, we, you need to sell something off stage. And so we just decided to do Half Hour Power, which was our set. That was the set we were playing live. So we just recorded it straight through, like how we would play it live. That's how we, that was the set list every night. Um, so then, then we toured it for about a year and a half, and then we put out All Killer. That's so cool. And I think one of the cooler things that I've read about um, your relationship with Island is, apparently the president of Island wanted you guys to wreak havoc on stuff and to film it is that true yeah he was really big on our personality like obviously he you know wanted the songs to be as good as they could and all that stuff but he was big on like us as people and what he saw in those epks and tour videos he wanted more of that he want he wanted he came from like you know his name's Lyra Cohen. he came from the beastie boys world and hip-hop world where you know those guys were doing that kind of stuff too back in the 80s and uh, so when he saw us, he kind of saw a little bit of us in those groups. Um, so he wanted more of that. And yeah, it was basically like the conversation was something like, you know, if you guys do all this and you get it on film, I'll, I'll pay for it. <laughs> so it was like a license to destruct. <laughs> That's amazing. Any funny stories in particular from that time of your life? Uh, well, I mean, there was never a safe hotel room or a safe bus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just it was constant, you know. It was <laughs> yeah, any flying TVs? Yeah, there was a couple smash TVs. Nothing out the window, I don't think. We were we were smart. We were smart about that, I think. But uh, broken TVs all the time. Yeah. It's hilarious. What's what's like the craziest thing you could think of that you're willing to say? Um, I don't know. I'm. It's a, it was just kind of. Uh, I mean, we're just kind of teenagers, just destroying stuff all the time. There's. I don't think there was like one major story. It was just like every bus we basically had to reupholster at the end of the tour because we just destroyed it. Um, we were pulling down ceilings from the bus. We were, we I threw it <laughs> by accident, but kind of not by accident, threw a rock through the TV on the bus. I kind of went to do it and I wasn't going to do it, but I did it. And I thought I was going to hit the wall, but I hit the TV um and it, sm- it just exploded <laughs> you know and uh, so stuff like that and stuff like that happened all the time for us <laughs> what about now <laughs> i'm guessing it's not the same it's a little bit more, more mellow now yeah <laughs> question about still waiting um because i honestly love that song growing up whose idea was it to have the sums as like the set in the band <laughs> Uh, I don't know, because we were going through a bunch of different things, like, because we wanted to kind of dress the same. Um, I don't know whose idea it was for that name, to be honest. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of ideas being thrown around because the strokes and the white stripes and the vines and all that stuff was like the new big thing at the time. So we were just kind of spitballing about how to, you know, whose video are we going to copy? Are we going to, what look are we going to do? And, and then the name change, obviously, <laughs> was the big one. And, uh, yeah, I don't know who came up with that though. Um, but <laughs> it all just came together and, you know, we actually told before we did that video, we were hanging out in London, England, doing a festival with the strokes and also oh, they knew about it. 
We, what's that? So the Strokes knew you were going to parody, parody them. Yeah, so we were hanging out, and they were, happened to be in the same hotel we were. So we we stayed up really late, Derek and I, with Julian in his room, and we were drinking and wasted. And and then I, and I think we, we just told him, we said, we have this idea to do a video like yours, and we're going to call ourselves the sums. We're not making fun of you. We're basically making fun of ourselves that we're kind of, ousted now from the you know the mainstream and now you guys are the big thing and we told him all about it and he he loved it and basically kind of i guess gave us his blessing and so we did it you know we probably would have done it we probably would have done it anyway but <laughs> but we want to you know he, you know we love the strokes and you know none of those bands um we liked all those bands and we were we were more making fun of ourselves uh, but it, it was funny to just tell him prior to the video to see what he thought that was another like one of those um turning points for the band where i was talking about this with uh, another interview i did um, a couple days ago where like we came off fat lip and in too deep and they were very successful for us and it would have been very easy for us just to go in and kind of do something like that again like you know most bands would just be like okay wow we, we our first record was really big and we had these songs but let's just try and do something like that again um and just keep it going but you know, we kind of did like a career suicide thing in a way, which happened to work for some whatever reason. And we chose to go with this heavy song as our first single with screaming in the verses, a political song. And I think that was kind of like that turning point for our band where people were able to now maybe take us seriously as a real band. And, sit, and you know, it's like we weren't just known as the Fat Lip Band or the In Too Deep Band. Um, so... You know, that song, I think that's a very, very important song for our band and our career. Now, that song, I love that song. And in particular, that music video is so iconic. I remember as a kid watching it on Much Music, I thought <laughs> I thought the intro was hilarious. Yeah. And you guys recently brought back that actor for another bit, right? Is that, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, his name's Will Sasso. He's actually Canadian. He's from B.C. Um, yeah, he was he was like our record company guy and Still Waiting video, and we... On this one, we brought him back, and he was still the record company guy, but now talking to us about, you know, basically the Rock is Dead thing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the guy, he's he's funny because, like, we, we obviously knew Mad, he was on Mad TV. But, you know, getting into a room with an actor like that, a comedian like that, and just he goes off the cuff, nothing's really written. He has a couple premises in his mind, then he just goes, and you have to kind of adapt on the spot. And it's really hard because... They're, they're so goddamn funny <laughs> that that you can't you're trying not to laugh the whole way through and you're trying to like interact with them but you know he's a he's a comedian pro and we're just a, you know a bunch of schmucks playing music uh, when he said uh, in that video green day 75 did he make that up or was that like written everything was off the cuff like like everything like everything he was saying he might have had mental notes in his head but nothing he had told us previous to it. We just kind of were like, you're going to walk into the office, you're going to sit down, and then you're just going to kind of go. And he, he, he obviously had a couple little things that he, he knew he was going to say, but he was just making up stuff, you know, hitting lamps over. Nothing was, nothing was set up. Oh, that was, that was on the spot? On the spot. He was making a point in that video about like the number bands, but there's only really two. It's just you guys and Blink-182, right? There was, right, yeah. Right? Yeah. That was like another one of his, like, you know, he was supposed to come off as like a naive record president. You know, it was like the last song written for Does Look Infected as well. Oh, it was so, the last song, really? Yeah, yeah. The album was pretty much done. We were going to go record it. And then Derek brought in this really rough demo uh, of it. And it was you know, really screaming in the verses, like distorted screaming. Um, didn't have any words. And but you could tell the melody was there and the idea was there. And so we did a little bit of quick pre pro on it because we had to go record the album. The album was basically ready to go get recorded. And then he just came in with this last minute song. That little rap scene at the beginning of Fat Lip, was that also ad libbed or did you guys plan that? No, we we had that one. Um, that was that was written. There was definitely uh, we had I think we had done that rap another time or something like that but that was like that was like we sat down and actually wrote that yeah that, 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 I mean, that video, video had no like treatment a big it was kind of um you know it was based off of that epk again that was just kind of us screwing around um and the only place that we could have people come out to our video that could be extras was pomona california 
because that was the only place that we could actually sell out a club in the United States at in anywhere in the United States. So we decided to do it in Pomona and had just people, we just told people to come out and, and just bring whatever you want to bring and act the way you want to act. And we didn't even know half that stuff was being filmed. Like we would sit in our trailer for hours and hours and hours and wait to do this, you know, play in the video. And meantime, our director was just going around and filming all these different cutaways. And we didn't, we didn't even know half that stuff existed until we got the first edit. And then when we saw the first edit, we we're like, holy, how'd you get that? Who's that guy? Where'd that guy come from? Why, why is he going, you know? So we didn't even know any of this was happening. And how long did it take to make this video? A couple of days? That was a two day. Very cool. That, uh, that shot with the person holding that, I think it was a goose at the beginning of the video. Was that at least, yeah. did they bring that? I think, you know, our director had like his team and they brought a couple props and I'm sure that goose was probably a prop at some point. That's um, funny. But yeah, all that stuff was either brought by the kids themselves or, you know, our, our, the prop team brought some stuff just to make things interesting. Fat Lip was released on April 22nd, 2001 as the lead single off of Sum 41's debut studio record, All Killer No Filler. To date, Fat Lip remains the band's most successful single, having reached the top of Billboard's modern rock track charts, and it remains one of their most iconic songs. For example, in the summer of 2001, Fat Lip topped MTV's Total Request Live and Much Music's Countdown, which is significant because the early 2000s was when pop punk was really at the front of popular music. And for Fat Lip to be that successful during that period of time really shows how influential that song was in the pop punk world. It is often considered to be one of the quintessential pop punk songs. But what makes it unique is that, unlike a lot of other pop punk songs, Fat Lip incorporates heavier musical elements as well. Rolling Stone magazine described the song in the following terms, quote, It's as if Sum 41 went from Blink-182 to Beastie Boys to Sabbath all in one song. So I remember growing up in the early 2000s, Sum 41 and Blink-182 were always associated with each other. Did you guys actually have a relationship? Did you guys know each other? We met them uh, pretty early on uh, and they took us on tour um, a little bit on All Killer. But yeah, I mean, we've known them probably since 2000. We uh, even recording All Killer, they came through Toronto and Jerry Finn, because he was our producer and produced their album. We went to the show and I think that was maybe one of the first times we've met them. So yeah, I mean, we've we've played a lot together and we met them, you know, it's probably been 20 years ago now. Any funny stories with the band? Nothing crazy, but they're just really, I mean, especially, you know, Mark and Tom, they're just hilarious guys. They're constantly funny like that's uh, you know travis is cool too like travis used to come to uh shows of ours on half hour power in pomona california at this place called the glass house and he would come and bring us like famous stars and straps stuff and Not cool. yeah and that was that was when no one knew who we were they you know he had just heard about us and came to the show to check it out and brought us all this all these clothes hey guys so just to expand on something cone mentioned the man who produced Sum 41's debut studio record was Jerry Finn. Jerry Finn is often considered one of the greatest pop punk producers of all time, having produced albums by Blink-182, Sum 41, Green Day, and more. Sum 41 recorded All Killer No Filler with Jerry Finn from parts of September 2000 until March of 2001. Blink-182 recorded Take Off Your Pants and Jacket with Jerry Finn from parts of January until March of 2001. So in other words, in March of 2001, Jerry Finn finished producing two of the most iconic pop punk albums in history. All Killer No Filler was released on May 8, 2001, and Take Off Your Pants and Jacket was released on June 12, 2001. Sadly, in July 2008, Jerry Finn suffered an intracerebral hemorrhage, followed by a major heart attack. He was taken off life support on August 9th and never regained consciousness, eventually passing away on August 21, 2008. He was only 39. Gone too soon, but his memory lives on through the music he produced. Growing up in the early 2000s, Sum 41 was one of the first bands I really got into, especially being from Toronto, which is essentially Sum 41's hometown. At the time, I remember Blink-182 and Sum 41 were always associated with each other, by the music press and by fans. So for me personally, getting to speak with Cone, I thought it was pretty cool to hear from him that there actually is an official connection between the two bands, so to speak, seeing how Jerry Finn worked with both of them. It is also interesting to note, in my opinion, how 
Although the two bands both came up in the pop punk scene, they've since gone in very different directions. Sum 41 has always incorporated heavier elements into their music, but especially with their last couple of releases, they've really gone farther and farther into the hard rock alternate metal universe, whereas Blink-182 has gone much more into a pop music direction. I'm not endorsing or criticizing either band for their musical evolutions, I just think it's an interesting point that these two bands, two of the most iconic pop punk bands in history, sound not much at all like each other anymore, at least in terms of their new releases. Is there any one music video in particular that you enjoyed making the most? Well, definitely, I mean, Still Waiting is definitely up there, but, um, you know, an easy one for us to make was the Hellsong video with the action figures. Because all we had to do is just kind of play with little figures for a little bit. And that was that was a funny one because we actually, you know, we had to get, we had to get approvals for all those action figures. Like we had to ask the person oh, really? if I could, if we could use their doll, and some people declined. Um, really? Yeah, like I think M Eminem might have said no, and Michael Jackson I think said no, unless he's in it. I can't remember if he's in it or not, but yeah, there was a bunch of people that just said no. So everyone in that video had to say yes, essentially. Yeah. Was it the same thing for Fake My Own Death? No, <laughs> we just kind of, if you watch it now, there's a couple of little blur outs. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Like that, and it's a stupid one, like that cat. Um, the, the rainbow cat, right? Yeah, he, he had some issue with being in the video, so we have to, we have to blur out that stupid cat. Um, so, but yeah, we just kind of went ahead and did that kind of stuff, because, you know, it's just the internet, it was just the internet, me, like memes and stuff like that, so. Yeah, you wouldn't think there's like copyright with memes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, for the, that cat thing, it's kind of like, you, you don't, because he wanted money or something, you know. Going way back to the beginning, at what point did you guys realize, like, this could actually be a thing, like, we can actually do this? It was probably around the time when record companies were coming up to see us play. Um, before we were signed, we were doing a residency in Toronto at this place called Ted's Wrecking Yard, and we did it every Wednesday. Um, and I think that was kind of like the turning point of like, oh, wow, not, not necessarily like we're going to have this long, elaborate career and we're going to sell millions of albums. But it was kind of this thing of like every record label from the U.S. is coming up to see us. There must be something here. Um, so let's try and let's try and do this and let's try and make a career of it. Um, not knowing, you know, at 19 years old, you're just like, oh, maybe this could last five years or, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. But, you know, you don't think about a 20 or 30 year career at that point. You just think, wow, this is, this is cool. This could be my job for a couple of years. Yeah. And how do you, how do you get from that point of like starting out as a band and actually getting labels to come see you before you're signed? Like, how did that happen? Uh, it was mostly the EPK that struck everyone's interest. It was that, that video that we sent out to everyone with our songs, with us, causing shit around our hometown that kind of piqued everyone's interest because we had we had sent those same songs out months and months before to the same record company and no one cared but now they're seeing like personalities of the band and stuff like that and it, that strike that all of a sudden struck everyone's interest like oh these guys are wild and crazy and and oh actually those songs are kind of cool <laughs> you know now that i'm hearing now now i'm hearing them in this context they're kind of they're good songs i guess and it just kind of took the video to, to, to make people realize, I guess. As a musician, like I, I'm friends with a lot of musicians and whatnot, and like they always say like, you know, there's a specific album I want to make eventually. Like, is there anything specific you <laughs> want to make that you haven't made yet? Um, nice roof, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he's fell. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, obviously there's, uh, I don't want to, we don't want to keep recreating the same album over and over and over. Um, I don't know. We just, we seem to find new ways of creating our own sound or, and not doing the same thing over and over. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know what, what happens or what we do. It's just, uh, I think we, we constantly, us in the band, like we all listen to a lot of different stuff. So whatever we're listening to at the time, maybe it comes into that next album or, you know, it was weird because around the time of recording Order and Decline, I was listening to a lot of like folk music. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me that, yeah. And so, and now I'm, yeah, now I'm listening to a lot of more like, because I've just been watching a lot of like, I've watched this new Rick Rubin documentary. I watched the evolution of hip hop. And now I'm listening to like 
old like hip hop again. And I haven't listened to old <laughs> hip hop for a long time. Yeah, and, and it just kind of was like, oh yeah, I really loved all that stuff when I was growing up. And I went, now I'm back to revisiting that kind of stuff. Um, so, I don't know. It's just, I think everything just seeps into your music as the time comes. Because, you know, albums are two or three years apart from each other. That's yeah. a lot of, that's a long time to get into other things or revisit other things. Do you have any one specific memory from your time as a musician that stands out for you? Um, yeah, I mean, there's been a couple moments. Um, I think still like doing a song with Iggy Pop is a big one. Um, Little. Yeah, Little Know It All, that song is like 2003. Um, just because of such a you know punk legend he is and down to earth and, you know, super smart and his performances are amazing. And so I think doing a song with him is definitely up there for me. Just as a band in general, uh, you know, like the Stones, for example, are like, I don't know, like 900 years old and they're still around, right? Uh, yeah. How long do you think you guys are going to be around for? Yeah, that's it's a tough question, but I still look at like, I kind of take uh, our, you know, the career path of like, I look at the older generation bands, like older bands, like the Damned and stuff are still playing and they're, you know, they got to be 60, like the Damned got to be in their 60s by now or late 50s so if bands like that can still do it i just kind of look at those bands that ahead of us and if you know if they're still doing it into their 70s i'm like yeah why can't we then you know metallica still plays super super fast anthrax you know they're they're all still doing it so and you just have to take care of yourself to be able to, to, to be able to go that long it's interesting you mentioned metallica because i was actually i was thinking of them as i asked this question because i think it was lars i'm not sure but a couple of years back one of them said uh Look, we're not the Stones. Like the music we play isn't like it's not. Um, it's much more technically difficult to play at the speed at which we go. So we don't know how long we can play for. So I just thought since you guys play like upbeat music as well, it might be a bit, it might be more challenging. Oh, it's gonna get tougher and tougher for sure. <laughs> There's no no question. But um, yeah, I just I I think if we take care of ourselves and you know um, uh, you know. I just, yeah, looking at the older bands ahead of us, I just, if they can do it, then that's something to strive for, you know? I remember you telling me that uh, Max's favorite video is In Too Deep. Um, yeah. How did you guys make that video? Especially when Steve was diving and then you got the stunt double and that kind of thing. Was that a fun shoot? That was a, that was a great shoot. I mean, that was a, that was a two day shoot. That was more like filming a movie than anything. It was, well, we had obviously the diving stunt doubles, um, but you know, it was a lot of trampoline work. Like everything, oh, all really the jumping yeah. and stuff, we had like trampolines. And the, I shouldn't even be telling. I shouldn't even be telling you this. The, the the tricks that we have. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nah, it's it's cool. How did you guys get that shot of Dave going in and out of the water? Yeah, so he was his he was strapped to a like this this electronic uh, floor, I guess. It was on it was like a crane, and it was underwater, and it just moved up and down on a controller. And his feet were strapped into it. So he, and the, but there was scuba divers underwater, you know, emergency scuba divers. So if he, you know, panicked, okay. they panicked, he could, they could undo his feet. Um, so I think it was a little terrifying for him because, you know, they put him under water and his feet were, oh, and his feet were strapped to this thing. And then they'd raise him back up and he'd come out and play. And they did that over and over and over. Jesus. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, did you actually dive off the diving board yourself? Oh fuck no, that thing, that <laughs> thing, that, that that's a that's it's like uh, that's way up there. I don't know how how tall those boards were, but they are really really high. Um, I was even you know you get it's like it was so high that you get like shaky knees being up there. Really? Oh yeah, it's really high. Jeez. I mean those those divers were doing it with ease, but they've been you know that's what they do. Um, but we had to stand right on the edge of it, and to make it look like we were diving. Uh, but no, there's no fucking way I was jumping off that thing. <laughs> and what, what is the song about exactly? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I, I guess, you know, I think it's a, just about being like in, you're in too deep into stuff. Like, you know, um, you just get your, you, you're in over your head. So on a serious note, in terms of being in a difficult situation, Back in the early 2000s, you guys were stuck in the middle of an armed conflict in the Congo, and that served as part of the inspiration for your album, Chuck. Could you explain a little bit as to what happened exactly? 
Yeah, we went over in 2004 to um, the Congo, and uh, we were supposed to go, like, there had been a big civil war there previous, and uh, three million people had died. It was the worst war in African history. And But the thing was, like, um, the mainstream media were, weren't really reporting on it, and not a lot of people around the world knew about this. And, you know, they have, they're really rich in minerals there. They have stuff you know coltan which we use for computers and phones um so and so a lot of the fighting was over these mines control of the mines that weren't controlled by anyone you know so um you know it was kind of a we we discovered it was like it was kind of a western world problem because we were getting all these minerals over here but they were suffering they had suffering the consequences of all this you know people dying and having to leave their homes and flee, flee to other countries. And so, so then we got together with war child Canada and, and they asked us if we'd want to go there and actually shoot a documentary. And we, after a long <laughs> thinking process about it, there'd been a ceasefire for a year. Um, we decided, yeah, well, okay, let's go do this. And we'll talk to X, you know, a lot of the soldiers were ch children, you know, six years, six years old, 12 years old, you know, like kids that were fighting in this war being drugged and thrown into the field and with a gun. And so we went to talk to all these kids and see how they were, you know, basically going, moving on with their life and, you know, uh, girls that were accused of witchcraft and all that stuff. Well, anyway, about a week, we were supposed to be there for about 10 days and a week in everything was going fine. I mean, it's a, it's a, it was a pretty, it's a scary place. Even when it, there's no, there's no war going on, you kind of feel a little, on edge like something could go wrong at any mo moment but um yeah this, this there's like this little battle that started at the border of rwanda and congo where this general tried to cross over um and he was denied access and he came back and just started firing at the border and so this whole like m mini war it was mini at the time but it escalated you know where there was r rockets and stuff exploding around our hotel we were stuck in two hotel rooms there's 40 people in the hotel and they all we all got ushered into two rooms one of them was actually my room <laughs> and uh for you know we were there for hours and hours and hours and there was one guy who was who was from the un who was staying at our hotel he's canadian his name was chuck peltier and uh he kind of took these 40 people us included under his wing and kind of like told us what to do and how you know and basically was in contact with the UN compound to a point where just the fighting got so close to the hotel that he kind of ordered tanks to come evacuate us. So, you know, big tanks came over to the hotel and evacuated the whole hotel. And we went to the UN compound and stayed the night on the, in the field on the, on, you know, the UN compound grass. And luckily the next day there was just like a school bus type bus that were taking people to the airport. Um, and so they took us to the airport and we kind of had our, we had a plane, like a, a chartered plane that we had taken into the Congo because there's, there's no like commercial airliners <laughs> that go into the Congo. Yeah. So we had our pilot who was brave enough to come pick us back up during all this and fly us out. That's crazy. And so that's the truck that you named your record after, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we told them we we were in the hotel. We said if if you get us get us out of here alive, we're gonna call the we're gonna call the album our new album after you. And that that was it. What was going through your head when all this was going on? Panic. <laughs> it was uh, well, you know, again, like it was it was something new for us. We'd never been in a war zone, and we'd never, you know, ha had bombs exploding around us. So it was it was unpredictable because we we definitely thought we were probably gonna die. Because it was, it was bombs were shaking the hotel and the roof was shaking, and um, you could tell the Congolese people that were there were really terrified, and they go through war all the time. So then, when you look at people like that that go through it and they're scared, then it's like, oh shit, this is real. Um, and they weren't, they weren't passing it off as just like some little squirmish. They were, they were terrified too. So yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. Is there, I mean, there are two totally different situations, but do you see any similarities from your experience in the Congo and this general Corona experience where like kind of life is put on hold? It, 
it, the the uh, the uncertainty if it will end, yes, like or, or when it was going to end, or and and the unpredictability of it, like, is pretty similar. But obviously, guns and bombs and stuff it was a little bit more extreme than this. Uh, but yeah, I think the similarity would be just like, when is this going to end, and 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 it being so unpredictable about you know. That's what it was like in the Congo. It was just unpredictable. Like we didn't know if there was going to be soldiers that were going to like come into our hotel and kill us all, or you know, it's just like today. Like we don't know if we go to the grocery store and some guy's going to sneeze in my face, and now I'm going to have <laughs> coronavirus. You know, it's like it's just unpredictable um, what's going to happen with these two situations. Yeah, no, I hear you. That's a that's quite poignant. Speaking of adapting, just again going back to music for a second. So one of the things that struck me at the concert you guys had in the summer is how heavy a lot of the sounds from um, Order and Decline are, right? And uh, I, f I find that 13 Voices in Order and Decline are your heaviest records since Chuck. Yeah. Is that because Brown Sound got back in the band? Like, what, what, what motivated you guys to get more heavy? I think we were just going that way. Like, Scream Bloody Murder was kind of heavy as well in 2011, and Dave wasn't a part of that. Um, I think it was just kind of, it was going that way. Like, after, after we did Chuck, and then we kind of went, back to like popular music with underclass i think we realized that was kind of like the turning point moment for our band where we were like we realized what we really wanted to do going forward because we did chuck which was heavy then we kind of went back to like the all killer sound and we're like after that we're like well you know what i kind of kind of prefer the heavy maybe and uh, i think we just that's where we're going do you think you'd ever make like a full out metal record is that in the cards <laughs> uh i think we just i think uh well i think the latest album, Order and Decline, is probably almost there. Like it's, it's got a lot of metal on it. I don't know if we just go full metal, but <laughs> I mean, I think there's always going to be tid, there's always going to be tidbits of like thrash metal and metal in some forty one. That movie I interviewed you for about two years ago, like Rock is Dead. The whole premise of that essentially was, you know, is rock music faulting and. One of the big things is like physical sales are dying, right? So yeah. now that this virus has literally cut off like any physical contact with the outside world, do you think that that could be like the death nail in physical records? Like, is it ever going to recover? It's quite possible, um, it, especially if this goes on longer. That like you know, vinyl stores they'll just the, a lot of them will go out of business. I, unfortunately, I think. Um, I don't see any way around it. it, unless it like you know, unless this thing wraps up in the next month or two, um, then they could probably survive. But if this lasts for a year, like and and because you know, up in Canada and especially in Toronto, because that's what I know is um, only essential services are allowed to be open, and uh, you know, so vinyl stores are closed. I mean, people obviously still sell records at shows from their merch table and stuff like that. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I hope not. Like I, you know, I love. I love walking around Toronto and driving around Toronto and seeing like a new vinyl store pop up. That's yes. that's crazy to me that they're they're actually still opening stuff and that's great. Um, so hopefully you know that continues and it doesn't have to go the opposite way. Yeah, I agree 100. percent I think that'd be really really awesome. Uh, there's a couple of stores I think on like Queen Street that were like selling vinyl and that kind of thing. But anyways, so I remember. Um, in the summertime, uh, that concert in Toronto, which thanks again for having me be able to get back on there. You had your son, Max, uh, on the side stage with you. Yeah. Now, because of this virus thing, uh, once things get settled down, do you think you'll still be comfortable doing that kind of thing? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think, like, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, terrorism in a way. You can't be scared to live your life after it's over, you know, and terrorism is obviously not over, but... Um, when this all comes to kind of an end, I think people are going to be a little bit timid about stuff, but you just have to kind of go on with like, you know, we kind of, I, I, I wash my hands all the time, no matter what. Like I kind of practice these things in my regular life. Like I don't like to be close to people, you know, at airports, if someone's like kind of up on me, I kind of like move to the side. Um, and so we kind of like instill that with our kids too, a little bit. I mean, we try and keep them, ki kids are germy. They're just like germ, germ sponges. Um, so, I mean, it's hard with kids, but yeah, again, like I can't, you, we can't just be terrified of life going forward. It's just, you just have to just adapt. From what I understand, you guys were heading over to Mexico when this whole thing broke out. Yeah, we, uh, we had some dates in March, um, right around, uh, March break in Canada. Um, we had four, four Mexico shows 
And we were actually, you know, right up until the day of going, we, there was still talk of us going. Um, Do you remember which time in March this was? This would have been, we were going to fly there the Friday or the Thursday or the Friday of like the March break of March break. Okay, so like mid-March. Mid-March, yeah. And, you know, I was talking to my manager basically every day, and they were just getting more information from, you know, from promoters. And, you know, promoters down there seemed to think everything was going to be fine. And they, they uh, you know, a lot of bands were still going, and some bands were considering canceling like us. Um, but we decided to cancel just because – and, you know – Good thing because during that week we would have been down there. We would have been down there for actually ten days. Um, that's when really all shit hit the fan, and that's kind of like we would have kind of possibly been stranded there. Um, and you know we had our return flights were coming through the U.S., so that would have been a problem coming back to Canada. So we're I think we're, we made the right choice, and you know we didn't really want to be a part of something where thousands, you know, fifty thousand people are in the same at the same event, um, potentially just getting each other sick and making this whole thing worse. So, you know, that was uh, on our minds as well. I mean, it's so uncertain. Like, do you, are you guys going to reschedule these shows or are they just going to be completely canceled? Like, what do you think is going to happen now? Yeah, the good thing about, uh, like, these festivals and even shows right now is they are, they are getting moved to the fall. Um, and even we just, we just postponed. Um, we had a tour and we're supposed to be in Australia um, with Offspring, you know, this this month, like maybe right now, I can't even remember the dates, but um, that's getting postponed to the fall as well. So the good thing about that kind of stuff is it can move. It's stuff like the big festivals in Europe, um, which are June, July, and August, those kind of can't be rescheduled. So those big festivals that have 20,000 to 60,000 people, um, if those go away, they just go away till next year which really sucks um you know at least at least these ones that are in the spring um can can try and get moved to the fall which you know promoters are trying to do so these gigantic festivals that are going to get canceled um obviously that's going to be a big hit on them financially would they be able to bounce back do you think the following year or is this going to be have like a residual effect for a while yeah i think it all depends on what bands you know, if you know, because obviously when you go to these big festivals, promoters give you a deposit up up front, and um, so I think it all depends on what bands do. Like if they give promoters a break and maybe give back their deposit and stuff like that. You know, I don't know. There's also insurance involved, and you know, there's all this stuff that you know p people are gonna have to work out. But yeah, I do feel really bad for promoters, and um, you know, some of these festivals the promoter needs to have these festivals to keep going and for a year to to take a year off it could be a big financial hit for a, a promoter and a festival so you know i hope hope things can get worked out yeah i hear you i was just thinking you know this morning uh for some of the newer bands that aren't established i guess for them this might actually be like a huge blow because um you know, I guess once you get your momentum starting as a new band and all of a sudden things are halted, it's hard to get back on that horse. Um, are you in touch with any, I guess, younger bands who are having these concerns? I've, I haven't really spoken to a ton of people while I've been off. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been seeing stuff online. And uh, yeah, I agree. Like, I think with the younger bands and especially bands that have albums coming out right now that, you know, need to put out an album and go right on tour. And, you know, bands that uh, make money and are just like, you know, tour to tour, be able to pay rent, go home, go back on the road, stuff like that, that they're going to be hit the hardest, I think. You're right. And um, and and not even that crew, like, you know, p p the crew that works for these bands are just off. Like, and, you know, a lot of them don't do anything else. They just, they're on the road nine, ten months of the year. And they don't have anything else to do. So, and, you know, most of them are tour to tour as well. So, uh, yeah, those are the those are the people that are going to be hit the hardest, unfortunately. Yeah, it sucks. Are the labels like? Uh, do you know if if they're getting ready to like help out these people, or like is this kind of an every man for themselves situation? Um, I don't know what other labels are doing. Our label, Hopeless, um, is giving bands a little bit of money to help them through, um, which is really nice. Uh, but you know, there's only you know as long as, if this keeps going on longer and longer, you know, there's only so much everyone 
can help with. And, you know, labels are obviously going to stop doing that. They're not going to keep paying for everyone, <laughs> you know, for months and months and months. But, uh, you know, it was nice of them to do this right now. And, uh, and um, you know, we just have to kind of all be in this together and stay home and, you know, and just get over it and, and not and not think this is um, something that's just going to go away on its own. It's not going to go away on its own. And um, we just have to all be in it together. You know, I'm just wondering about you guys as a band. I mean, it's if you're a solo artist, this is already difficult enough. But as a band where you have to have a group of people together, I'm, sh I'm sure this must be a bit of a difficult time for you guys. How is Sum 41 dealing with this situation? Uh, we this is because it's so new, like we haven't really spoken about anything other than just canceled tours um you know we obviously we message each other about you know how you do like checking up on each other and stuff like that you know tom is probably having the worst time because he lives in new york city and his and his wife's a doctor so she's she's basically a, f a frontline person um so she's still going into work every day in a hospital and tom lives right down in new york city and so I think I feel really bad for him. But uh, yeah, as for us, I think we're just kind of just taking it as it goes. We don't really know what's going to happen. We're just trying to reschedule stuff for the fall um, without losing too many shows because um, we want to do them all. We haven't been to Mexico for a long time. We haven't been to Australia for a really long time. So we want to be able to do all these shows and, and make them up somehow. So, you know, there's not a lot of talk between our band and management right now other than just trying to reschedule stuff yeah for sure and i'm just thinking as you mentioned tom living in new york uh at the time of this recording right now the u.s canada border is pretty much closed except for essential travel so would that mean that even if like let's say tom wants to meet up with you guys he can't he's he's stuck in the states for the time being well i mean three of three of our guys are in the states derek lives in la frank lives in la and tom's in new york and dave and i are up here so you know, it seems also that the U.S. is having a much rougher time, especially New York City, than Canada right now. So I don't even know what that would look like if Canada somehow gets um, to a place where everyone can start living normal lives and doing stuff again. But the states are still still has a lot of problems. I don't know if they'll be able to leave and come back, you know, that kind of thing. So because we were in, we're in two different countries yeah, and no, sure. I'm not sure that I'd be able to even go to the states to do anything right now. You know, or if even if Canada gets better and the States is still bad, I probably couldn't go down there. And so I don't know what I don't know what it's all going to look like. Um, we'll have to see. Yeah, no, for sure. No, I have a lot of friends in um, New York State and New Jersey, and I've been in touch with them and kind of saying, like, are you guys doing all right? So it's a very odd situation going on right now. Um, you know, all of us are hoping that this thing will get resolved as soon as possible. But, you know, God forbid, if this goes on for like several more months or even up to a year or so, that's going to change all of our lives. Uh, have have you as a band had any conversation about what you would do if this goes on for that long? Like, do you have any idea? No. <laughs> I try not to think about that stuff right now. Uh, I think our focus is just trying to s stay at home and stay safe and make the right choices um, for touring, um, even, even if we're allowed to tour or not in the next coming months, you know. If June, the next tour we have booked is June, mid-June, we're supposed to go to Europe. So that's kind of the next. As of now, nothing's canceled. But, you know, as this thing kind of progresses, we'll just have to see. I don't, you know, we, no one knows. So we, do, we definitely have not talked about long-term effects of the band. But, um, yeah, I mean, if this goes on for six months, eight months, there's going to be some serious, some serious shit <laughs> that happens yeah. to not just us, but, like, you know, a lot of people. Um, so... We'll have to have that conversation as it comes, I guess. Yeah. Now, I read an interesting stat earlier today. I'm just going to pull it up for a second. Um, so in mid-March, uh, between March 13th to the 19th, uh, global Spotify streams for the top 200 actually dropped by 11%, which I was very surprised to hear oh. that because I would have thought that everyone's inside. Everyone's going to be listening to more music, right? Uh, yeah, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube went up, but Spotify went down. Even I think last week, uh, the weekend released his big album that everyone's been like waiting for, and Spotify was still only up by like three percent. So bottom line, people are inside and they're still not listening to as much music. Like, are you yeah. surprised to hear that? Like, I was very surprised <laughs> to hear that. Yeah, I'm actually pretty shocked. Um, but you know, I think 
for for a lot of people, they're they're at home, but a lot of them are just working from home. Um, you know, I think people are still trying to be, you know, still trying to make money somehow, and still trying to do their job. And you know, and also, I have two kids. Literally during the day, I I can't do anything because I'm just watching two young kids um, who are just ravaging my house because they can't get outside, they can't go to parks, they can't go to school. They, you know, we're not allowed in parks. We're not, you know, we can't take them to the grocery stores or anything like that. So um, I, I am surprised, but I'm not because I don't listen to a ton of music in the day either um, because I'm just doing stuff with the kids and, you know, trying to have a little bit of order in their lives. <laughs> so, you know, I listen to music at night during dinner and like cooking dinner and stuff like that. But it is a little surprising because even people that work from, from home, you'd think they'd have like, you know, some kind of stereo on. People that work from home that don't have kids probably think this is great. They're like, I get to have my own hours. I get to work in my pajamas. I can do whatever the fuck I want, <laughs> you know, whatever I want. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely surprised that there's not more streams going on, but yeah. Yeah, here you go. From what I remember, Max is about three. Is that correct? Max is five now. Oh, five now. Jeez, it's been a while. Yeah. So uh, both your kids are in uh, elementary school, I take it, right? Yeah, Max is in uh, s senior kindergarten and, and our little girl, Isla, is one and a half. Oh, God bless him. Is that your kid on the side? Yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> Where's your shirt? Is that Max? Yeah. Let me say hi. Say hi to Daniel. What's up, Max? He's got a cut on his hand he wants to show me. You got two cuts on your hand. Two yeah. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Max, you're on break. Okay. <laughs> okay. You gonna say hi? Hi. Hi, Max. Um, How's it going? You don't have homework? No. <laughs> Where's your shirt? Where's your shirt? I took it off All right. I'll, I'll be up in a sec. Getting bigger, Daddy. Daddy, this one's getting bigger. Well, okay. Yeah. We'll clean it after. <laughs> Sorry. No worries, man. How are you guys as parents handling it like this situation? Is it, is it difficult for you guys? It's, it's hard because you're trying to just um, entertain them all day. You know, like we get to go, we go, we take them to like a, an empty field or try and find an empty field or take them for a walk where there's not a lot of people, stuff like that. You know, try and stay away from as many people as possible. Take them bike riding. Um, but yeah, you just, you start to run out of things to keep their attention and their kids. So they don't have, they have short attention spans in general. Um, yeah. so yeah, I think, you know, a couple more weeks of this and I might have to up my alcohol intake. Intake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I guess on that note for, for you, I mean, like you're a, a musician in one of the biggest bands out there. You guys are always working, like having to be stuck at home. How is that for you personally? Is, is it difficult for you to deal with? Yeah. I mean, I'd much rather be, you know, obviously I love being home with the kids. It's cool to be able to actually hang out with my kids because we've been gone for so long. But the the feeling of not having anything coming up, like I just looked at my calendar yesterday and like April is just clear and May is clear. <laughs> that never happens to us. Like I see nothing on it, nothing, no shows, no rehearsals, no interviews, no anything. And that's a weird feeling because um, normally when we're off for this long, we're doing pre-production or recording a new album or something like that that's the only time we get like extended periods of time off is for writing and recording with not having anything going on it's definitely a strange strange feeling um you know i get to from about 8 p.m till i go to bed i'm, I'm working on music constantly still writing with other people right now and um stuff like that so you know i still get some music time it's just not the same it's it's having, it's also having nothing to look forward to in the way of touring, you know, it's just, and June, uh, you know, I'm hoping that June will happen, but I, I kind of have my doubts. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the way things are going, who knows, right? Uh, now, one of the, I guess, on a lighthearted note, um, I've noticed that on online, there's a lot of like parody songs about the virus people are making and they're going viral. Uh, would you ever actually write a song about the situation? Do you think that might happen? Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people will. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I you know, it's, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people will talk, will probably write stuff about isolation and this dark time and stuff like that. But uh you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I will. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like with this time off for all these bands, most bands should be coming out with their best record after this because they have yeah. nothing but downtime. 
Like, you know, a band should be just just like hunkering down in their home and writing music and using this time to like write great songs. And hopefully, you know, in the fall or the winter, we're going to see some bands with some amazing albums coming out because they've had so much time just to sit around and write. I was just for fun. I was writing like a little skit, like if I were a musician, what I'd be doing right now. And I, I wrote something as a joke, but then I realized it might be true. Um, if you guys were to try a band practice over Skype, would that be possible or would that be difficult because you can't hear each other properly and that kind of thing? Yeah, it, it's hard. I actually was, um, we, I was talking about uh, doing like a online thing with Todd from Offspring because me and him and I have that Operation MD band and we haven't done it for a long time, but we we're talking about like, what if we did like a live little acoustic performance and we were trying to do it, but there's, there's a lot of latency in videos. Yeah. And so we were trying, yeah, and it was weird to hear each other, even with headphones. Um, so it is, I, there must be a way of doing it because a lot of bands are doing it or you just kind of like pre-record something or, um, but it's hard. <laughs> I think it's, it's the latency issue in the internet, you know? For sure. And I was just thinking, you know, now that everyone is basically like separated, like if you're in a band, like, I mean, you're de facto, I guess, a solo artist temporarily, right? Um do you think there'd be any any people that might actually break off from being in their band now that they're actually isolated and they prefer being that way? <laughs> I don't know. Well, like I say, I think everyone, I think everyone's just going to be, who's a musician will just be like writing music right now. So there, yeah, there could be like an influx of solo albums coming out and stuff like that. You never know. Like, and you know, the 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 thing I've found is, which is amazing is, you know, for a lot, a lot of years and stuff, I've been like, I've been producing other bands and doing little co-writes with people here and there. And I've always like done it in person. And actually I've been like writing with other people through FaceTime and Skype like that. And I actually love it because you can just kind of, you know, when you have someone over to your studio, you're kind of like there for hours and you run into a roadblock and you're kind of like, ah, how do I get this guy out of my house now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whereas like uh, on FaceTime and stuff, he's like, all right, well, let's, uh, let's work on some stuff. I'll call you back in two hours or whatever. I'll call you back tomorrow. And I I've actually really loved doing co-writing through the, in like through FaceTime and stuff like that. And um, so I I've learned something. <laughs> Don't do it in person as much. Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you think that this, once things get back to normal, like, do you think that, this will actually have changed the business like is are things going to go back to exactly how they were or will this have you know changed yeah i i, well, I just have a feeling that um i think the touring world is going to be hurt by this the most because i think like we were talking about before promoters are really going to um suffer a lot and i think crew you know maybe crew people might quit the business because they have to right now and they might just like find something else to do I mean, the the problem is with something like this is everyone's now going to be scared about it happening again. Yeah. And so everyone's going to be possibly looking for this that backup plan of like, what if this happens again? So this has happened now, but what if this happens again next year? Um, I have to have a plan, and I think people would be smart to like have a little bit more of a plan. I mean, this is the biggest thing um, that's happened in our lifetime. I was, I was talking about this with someone else. This hasn't happened in about 100 years where things are shut down. I think when, like, the Spanish flu happened in, like, 1918. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's 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 possible something that, like this will happen again. So I think people, this is a pretty good learning experience for people. Um, so, but, yeah, I think, I do think uh, the music industry is going to, it's going to have to claw its way back a little bit from this. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I don't think that, uh, like, online sales will get hurt but i agree with you that the touring is i think i'm very curious to see what my first concert experience is going to be like once this is over you know what I, I know mean? like are they gonna do you think they might have like limits as to how many people could be in this area or like what do you think yeah. might happen that's the thing is like they're gonna have to slowly let this all happen again and like how can you just have a festival of sixty thousand people just like okay we can do this again yeah exactly yeah and then and trying to you know, bet on the fact that no one in the crowd has it. You know, it could be a year, year and a half, you know, or whenever they're going to start doing vaccines and stuff like that um, before they'll allow these massive festivals again or even big arena shows or amphitheater shows or anything like that. Even for sports, I'm thinking, like, what's going to happen with them, you know? Sports, yeah, this whole thing. But rock concerts are unique in the way that everyone just kind of is, like, 
up on each other you know? And, you know yeah like there's the pits and like you know the crowd surfing and sweat and all this stuff so it's those are pretty unique experiences and uh yeah it's gonna be i don't know what it's gonna be like yeah i mean god forbid but if like let's say the touring world is permanently changed from this um and some 41 has to become more of a non-touring band would that have an impact on you guys creatively or like in terms of your longevity? It's a hypothetical question, but I'm just curious if you've maybe thought about that. Yeah, no, I haven't really thought about that. But um, yeah, I th obviously, it's still make music and uh, put it out. Um, and I don't think we would necessarily change much in the way of our sound or anything like that. But um, it would just that would suck. Yeah. <laughs> 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 If you guys were starting out as a new band now, you know, this virus situation, how, you know, dark things seem to be, would that have had an impact on your songwriting? Yeah, I mean, it's possible because our whole career, we've, uh, you know, basically just done stuff for that moment in our life. Um, you know, the first record, All Killer, was we were fresh out of high school. So all we could talk about was high school and what we knew from high school years, high school relationships, high school parties. Um, as soon as we had toured the world, we did Does It Look Infected, and now we were talking about more world issues and stuff like that. So we've always like um, done songs from our experience and what we've gone through. So, yeah, I think if we were starting now, it's possible we would just... Well, it depends what age we are and what we are interested in. But, yeah, there's a lot of political shit going on right now, and then now this disease and virus and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's possible... We'd be talking about different things right now, right out of the gate. You know, obviously it is a scary time and it's, you know, people are bored and everyone's bored and wants to get back to their regular life. But this is a serious, serious issue and um, that can't be taken lightly because if it's taken lightly, it's just going to last a lot longer and more people are going to die. So, um, yeah, I just, I kind of just concern myself with, you know, um, trying to keep my family safe right now and just do the right thing, make the right choices and try and keep everyone from getting sick around me is there anything is there a message you have for people in general well i think if you uh, to me like i just think about how i feel about it and uh, to me i feel like i want to definitely like i can't wait to get back to just regular life and do the things you want to do and you know go out see shows you know walk down the street and not have to worry about it and the only way we're going to get to that point is to just you know follow these guidelines of social distancing, physical distancing, washing your hands a lot. Um, and just, if you can just, uh, if, if we can all just do that, it's going to end eventually. It has to end. And, uh, but if, you know, if you don't seem to care about that and, <laughs> and uh, don't believe in it, then this is just going to keep going on. It's just going to cycle around, cycle around. People are going to get sick and die. And, and this, we'll just have to be inside. Stores will be shut down. Restaurants will be shut down for many more months. But if we can just all get on board, then this will end quickly and we all you know i personally like i can't wait to get back to just doing normal stuff again so i'm just i it sucks to sit inside all day especially the weather's starting to get better but um it's just something we have to do right now cohen as always it's great talking to you man thanks so much for your time too yeah for sure talk to you soon